Good morning, church. The first reading today is taken from Jeremiah, chapter 14. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our apostasies indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot give help? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning his peop this people, Truly they have loved to wander, they have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but find no good. For a time of healing, but there is terror instead. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor our glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? It is not you, O Lord our God. We set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. We will read Psalm 84 responsibly by verse. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has come into her house, and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young by the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose heart are set in the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the desolate valley will find in it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They will climb from height to height, and the God of gods will reveal himself in Zion. The second reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the readings. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I see we have children. Hi.
And I like to remind people we're all children of God. We never outgrow that. So this is for all of us. So you, we can focus on them, but uh, I think the child inside each of us, uh, um, you can participate in your mind and even with your voices. Good morning. Have you ever been um, uh, to a place where they did cheers? Like they, they echo, echoing cheers like at a football game, right? All oh, right, okay. So we're going to do a little cheer. Repeat after me. I, I am. am. Give me an A. a. Give me a child. 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 Give me of. of. Give me a God. God. Put them together. What does it say? I am a child of God. Those six words can shape our whole lives to be very different from what they would be without those six words. We as Christians, especially um, if we're aware of our baptism and aware of our adoption into God's family, um, can really grab hold of those words. But sometimes I think they're even more than the baptized that are children of God. Sometimes I think all humanity, all of us are children of God, whether we know it or not. But those six words can really again, shape our lives every day. And you could, um, I've sometimes done different things with these words uh, over the course of a week. You can say that sentence each day focusing on a different word. I am a child of God. And think about what that means. I am a child of God. That's a little different. It's the same sentence, the same words. But if you focus on a different word each day and think about what that means for your life, um, and so that's something that you can do if you want. Maybe some adults will think to try to do that. And uh, each time we say that and think it, it reminds us of who we are. We're not just the person that, you know, the, the name that we're given, David, right? And what's your name? Bryce. 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 And so we are still David and Bryce. We're always going to be the name we're given, um, the son of our parents, the grandson of our grandparents, um, as we go through different groups in life, the schools, a member of this school or that, this club, this church. So we all have those identities. But child of God is an identity that, again, we can claim it or not. We can live in God's kingdom and God's family and not really know it, and a lot of people do. Or we can even come to church and not, not really make full use of that identity, not really fully realize every day how that changes our life. So, um, again, you can uh, um, continue this during the weeks ahead, um, and I hope some folks will, adults are, but the child in us needs to be reminded because sometimes we forget that we're children of God, and we just think that, you know, we have a job to do and we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to manage and direct and be in charge and do all these things, and uh, sometimes it can balance that out if we remind ourselves we're children of God. And that means that we have a loving God who loves us, um, who cares for us, who wants us to grow into full, happy, abundant lives. And uh, so remember that. Never forget. Um, let's say it again one more time. I am a child of God. Oh, again. I am a child of God. Everybody. I am a child of God. Don't you forget it, okay? Thanks for coming forward. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless these words. Bless our hearts and ears and minds that we may hear and receive your word, your truth, your love, your life in these moments and every day of our lives. We pray as your children, in Christ's name as Christians. Amen. First, a few words about our 
disturbing Old Testament lesson, if you really read carefully, and if you read the part that gets skipped out of the lectionary, I've always, since a kid, anytime the lectionary skips verses, I've got to go see, what are they cutting out? And it's even more of a, an unforgiving God, a judging God which is a good antidote uh, when we get to presume on God's forgiveness. We love to have a loving, forgiving God, and we usually focus on that, especially as Lutherans, grace and love. But there are places in the Old and New Testament where it seems that God is a God of judgment and not always forgiving when we expect it. And it challenges our sense of entitlement. Well, I'm God's child, so God should forgive me. Or I've only done this little thing, God should forgive me. I haven't done those big bad things. I haven't committed those big sins. God should forgive me. And it's that sense of entitlement and self-righteousness that got the Pharisees in trouble. The Pharisees were a group of, we, we sometimes as Christians think of Jewish people as one monolith, you know, the, the Jewish people. Well, if you look in the Old Testament, there are many different theologies at work. There are many different um, understandings and, and different groups of Jews focused on different heroes. Some focused on Abraham, some focused on Moses. And some, it's the whole story, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some go all the way back to Adam. And there were some Jews in Jesus' day who, um, the Pharisees, who felt that to live a godly life, you needed to understand God's rules, God's laws, and live it out. Obey and, and, and show that you were God's person and show what God wanted by living out those things. But even more, some of the um, uh, scribes and Pharisees focused their lives on telling other people how to live their lives, how to follow God, how to obey. And in a way, there's something good about that. There's something good about trying to lift up God's uh, expectations of our life, lift up God's intention for how we were, are to live. But it often became a telling other people what to do, judging other people. These people did it wrong. Those people did it wrong. If you're not in my group, if you're not doing it my way, you're doing it the wrong way. God's word is like this. But even there, they would, Pharisees, uh, um, the rabbis would have debates with each other over what different uh, texts meant in scripture and others that they used. And so the Jewish faith is not one monolith. It's as, as splintered and, and many different colors as the Christian faith. But one of the things that a lot of people had in common then and now is the sense of, I do things the right way. Others who do it different are doing it the wrong way. My way of following God is the right way. Theirs is the wrong way. My understanding of God is right. And anyone who has a different understanding, there's something weird or strange or wrong about them. And it reinforces old traditions that, that developed, and uh, maybe the, they were good at the time, but they end up being handicaps for us. There's a big patriarchal tradition. Uh, back in biblical days, women had no equality, no rights, women were property, women had no real identity other than the man that they were attached to, their father or their husband. There was no social security, a woman's security was her husband, her father. And women were not supposed to be educated, and women were not supposed to think or write, they were supposed to just raise the family do the work. And that patriarchal tradition um, 
shows itself in that the Bible mostly focuses on male people, and it's mostly men who get named. And very often, Old and New Testament, it'll say a woman, the woman at the well. Uh, different women who meet Jesus, they're not given names usually because even in Jesus' day, the women were not that important. And the patriarchal tradition reinforces our idea that God is a man in the sky. God is a man. Men have power. God has power. God is male. And in our own context, our own time, as there are different understandings of God or different words used, some people get very upset. The tradition, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a tradition of the church, and there's a lot of good in it. But it was developed in a time when all the symbols of power were male. As some people use images of God as creator, mother, shepherd, some of those are male and some are female. But even Jesus said, you know, um, oh, I wish that um, uh, they were all gathered as a hen gathers her chicks, giving God a, a female image, a, a hen gathering her chicks. But a lot of us today, we kind of write that off. That's strange. That's wrong. You know, that's feminizing God. Well, God is both male and female and, and neither. God is not human. But we can't. We have trouble dealing with a God that's not human. We've got to give human images, and so we do. And throughout Scripture, we give human images of God. And we fight over who's right and who's wrong. And we fight about the old theologies and the new theologies, although there's more than one of each. There's dozens, there's hundreds of different ways of understanding God and different ways of living out our identity as God's people. We can be like the Pharisees and study all the rules, the commandments, and, and what we're supposed to do, study all the New Testament for all the rules, and then spit them out and declare who's not following the rules. And far too many Christians today do that, live as modern-day Pharisees, Dividing the world, drawing their lines into who's in and who's out. We're making outcasts out of the people that don't seem to be doing it right. Making humanity into a pecking order, which is the human side of us as we go through life. As we enter a situation, as we meet a new person, they say within seven seconds, you're, you're making your first impression of that person and where they stand in the pecking order. And are they more educated? Are they uh, more authoritative? Are they to be trusted, respected? All this in seven seconds. The human side of us is trying to always figure out where we fit in, who's above us, who's below us, judging others. Trying to be God without knowing it. Trying to judge the world. And it's an especially strong temptation for religious folk of any religion, any Christian denomination, but any non-Christian religion. Uh, one of the temptations is to divide into who's a better follower of God, who's a better liver of this life. And the Pharisees are a good example. They worked at trying to live things, live out their life right. They worked at trying to learn the laws. They worked at trying to obey and follow the laws. They did a lot of good stuff. They may even have good intentions as we do when we follow their footsteps. We want the rest of the world to know God and follow God the way we do. And there's a little bit of missionary zeal in that. And again, that's not all bad. But the human side of us 
sooner or later gets involved. The human side of us that looks at life from the self-centered perspective, what's in it for me? What's going to be better for me? As we make our agenda and schedules and budgets, as we live our lives and make all the choices and priorities, it always comes down to what's going to make life better for me? What's going to make me happier or more comfortable? We go to the market. We look for the lowest prices when we're buying something so we can get more for our money. And if we're selling something, we want to sell it for as much as we're able to sell it for, get the highest price. And that works its way into our whole system. If you're an employer, you try to get good workers for as little as you can pay. If you're an investor, you try to get something that has the best return for the money you put in. And all of it's an effort, the human effort, to try to move up the ladder, climb up the mountain, be king of the hill, be on the top. And we see it when we see ourselves judging others. When we pray something or or even think something like this Pharisee, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like one of those people. I want to ask for a show of hands, but it's not right. But think in your mind, have you ever said that to yourself or to God? Have you ever been glad that you're fortunate that you don't have to live a life like that? And sometimes it even uh, shows up in our paternalistic charity. We want to help those people. But in helping, we're trying to lift ourselves up. I'm doing a good thing. I'm sharing a little extra money or whatever with those people who have, uh, don't have enough. And aren't I doing a good thing? Aren't I living out the godly life? Whenever we try to divide God's family, God's children, into those who are better or those who are worse, those who are above us or those who are beneath us, those who are inside our group and those who are outside our group, we're trying to divide God's family, God's creation. We're trying to carve up our circles and take our possession, our ownership of our little area. The Pharisee was pretty happy with himself. He knew he had done some good things that week. He knew that he was basically following God's law. May have even been aware of some of his sin and some of his shortcomings. But when he goes up to the temple to pray, Lord, thank you that I'm not like those people, thieves and rogues and murderers. I fast twice a week. Fasting was important. In Old and New Testament, Jesus and the disciples fasted. Fasting was a way to really concentrate your spirit on God and let God be the one in charge. God be the all-powerful. And sometimes during a fast, you feel the hunger. You feel your vulnerability. You feel your humanity. But he also took it as a point of pride, another check. Oh, I fasted this week twice. I fasted twice every week. What a good boy am I. I give a tenth of all my income, just as the law requires. Now, a lot of us today, we kind of work our way around it and say, well, Jesus came, so all the laws of the Old Testament don't count. The whole idea of tithing or we're doing this or that or the food we eat or washing. Uh, yeah, or Jesus came to free us from all the law. And so we don't have to worry about the fact that we didn't even do what the Pharisee was doing. But this sense of entitlement. Lord, I'm a good Christian. Forgive me, I made mistakes. I've fallen short. It's a very different tone from the tax collector. 
The tax collectors were Jews who kind of were seen as traitors. They were in cahoots with the Roman occupiers, and they were the ones who would uh, go to the other Jews and, and collect the taxes and send them on to, to Rome. And so they were seen as traitors for that. And their salary was they would get a cut of what they collected and uh, what they were assigned was very small, but if they collected more than what was called for, then they could take, pocket the difference. And so for a tax collector to survive and raise their family, they basically had to extort money from their fellows so that they could get enough to survive on. Kind of like people who are paid minimum wage or less. Sometimes they count on the tips or other ways that they can um, get more compensation. And so this tax collector knows he has a snowball's chance and a hot place. He doesn't feel entitled to forgiveness from a loving, forgiving God. He stands far off and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's his identity. That's his label. And he lives with it. We all fight for the good labels. As we go through life, we want the education, we want the status, the position, we want the, all the good labels. And some of the best labels there's a lot of competition for. Economic power, political power. There's people who work all their lives and invest their lives to climb those ladders. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Can you imagine if that's your label for your life, sinner? Now, I imagine some of us have at times seen that as, us as a sinner, and some of us know what that's like. And it's in our tradition, and it's, again, probably in most of our history at one point or another, and many of us, we love hymns like Amazing Grace, it saved a wretch like me, although most of us, many of us, haven't felt like a wretch in a long time. But it's the sinner, it's the wretch, it's the person who has no hope in their righteousness that leans on God and God's mercy and God's love and doesn't expect it, doesn't feel entitled but cries out and begs, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus tells this parable. And again, with all of Jesus' parables, we don't know if they actually happened or not, if it's a story he's retelling or if he's making up a story to, to make a point. It doesn't really matter if it really happened or not. As Jesus tells this story, he's making a point. This man went down to his home justified rather than the other. Sometimes the bigger our sin or disobedience, the more sorrow we feel and the more we appreciate God's forgiveness when we receive it. And the more we understand a loving God who can love us and forgive us in spite of our sin and wretchedness. But when we're in our comfort zone of being with a loving God and we're on God's side, we're in God's church, God, our God is a loving God, a forgiving God, sometimes we can become like the Pharisee and feel pretty well off, pretty smug and entitled and
and unconcerned for the other, the outsider, the sinner, the tax collector, when we feel that we've risen above that. may even get to the point, Lord, thank you that you didn't make me like those people. Jesus isn't just trying to teach us how to be better people. Jesus is trying to teach us how to look at the world with God's eyes as children of God. And instead of the human way of drawing circles and and ovals and and all the weird shapes of, of, of who's in a good group and who isn't, finding our bondage with all of humanity, just as Jesus could have lived as a, a superhuman, superhero, all that power, but Jesus tried to live as a human being and did live as a human being, even going to a cross to die. And all his life, he tried to teach people that way of life, that vision of life, that vision of God as a loving daddy or mommy. So when we read parables like this and we're tempted to put ourselves in the parable and we don't want to be the Pharisee because we know that Jesus is saying that's not the right way to be. But we often also don't want to be the tax collector robbing from our friends and neighbors to give to the high and mighty above us. So what is your image of God? What is your image of our relationship to God? What is your image of our relationship to one another, to friends? to foes, enemies, to strangers, to outcasts. And how well do we understand and follow God's loving example of reaching down, forgiving the unforgivable, forgiving the ones we can't forgive, but also that scary image that maybe God doesn't forgive us when we expect it, when we feel entitled. That should be enough to get you thinking for a week or a month. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling humanity to, to your intention for how to live with one another, how to live this human life. We ask for your mercy and your help to understand more clearly and to follow you more more nearly. Help us when we get to be judgmental, when we take your throne of judgment. Help us when we feel like we're better than others and help us when we feel like we're on the bottom of the pile and hopeless about forgiveness. Help all of us, Lord, wherever we are in our lives to join together and help one another instead of helping ourselves. We thank you for your love, which helps all of us for sending your Son to lead us and guide us, and for bringing us together today and every so often that that we can be renewed in our relationship with you and one another and the world that you've given us. We pray as your children. We bear Christ's name as little Christs 
Christians. Amen.